Watch AutoLine After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion, and by Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. All right, welcome everybody to another episode of AutoLine After Hours. Today we're not in the studio. We're out at Leapers Fork, Tennessee. It's a very rural part of the country and we're going to be talking all about the Alfa Romeo Stelvio today because that's where they're doing the North American introduction of the vehicle. Joining us for the show are Reed Bigland, who is the head of all Ralph Alfa Romeo worldwide right now. And Reed, great to have you on the show Thank today. you very much for having me, John. It's my pleasure to be here. And I've got two of my colleagues joining me right now too. Mark Phelan with the Detroit Free Press and Roman Micah with the Fast Lane Car. And great having the both of you guys here. Pleasure too. to be here, John. Thank you, John. So Reed, this has got to be maybe the most important Alfa Romeo ever introduced as you reestablish the brand, not just here in North America, but worldwide. Well, it is incredibly exciting uh, to, to be here with the Alfa Romeo Stelvio and the whole world seems to be wired towards SUVs. And this is Alfa Romeo's first SUV in the over 105 year history of the brand. And we feel it's not only an SUV, it handles like a two seater sports car. So it's gonna give you all of the functionality that you would expect from an SUV, but those driving dynamics that you now expect from an Alfa Romeo. It's uh, been on sale a while. You've had it in Europe and it looks like it's off to a great start there. So one would think the same thing would happen here. Well, we hope so. Off to a great start in, in Europe. Started shipping uh, fundamentally March 1st of, of just last year in Europe. Uh, last year in the European market, we sold 8,000 uh, Alfa Romeos in the month of May, uh, up over 50% over the same period last year. And all going well, the Stelvios will start to hit U.S. showrooms uh, next week, uh, really the second week here, or third week of June, and uh, also rolling out into China at around the similar time frame. Mm -hmm. it, it's based on the same architecture as the Julia sports sedan that you launched last year. What was the thinking in, in terms of going first with the, the sedan and, and what do you expect the division among buyers to be between the sedan and the SUV? Well first we wanted to go after the heart of the market and at the time with the sedan the premium mid-size sedan market was the largest premium segment in the world. Now when we look at the premium SUV market it now represents 25 percent of the premium market in the U.S where the mid-size sedan market has eroded a little bit, whereas about 22%. So we wanted to do both of those segments to go after really the heart of the market. And with these first two alphas, about 50% of the market is covered with this. But we also wanted to establish that strong driving dynamics of alpha that all of the great alphas were known for. And really to do that, it needed to start with a sedan, but we feel we have no compromise here now in this SUV. And you and, and you expect to sell roughly equal numbers of the two here in the U.S.? Should be similar numbers, I think, given the way that the segment now is growing on the midsize SUV. I wouldn't be surprised at this time next year we're selling more of the SUVs than we are in the sedans. But hey, time will tell, and they're two great, uh, great vehicles. You know, it's amazing just how much crossovers and SUVs have kind of taken the market by storm, right? I remember when the F-Pace came out, which competes yep. directly with this, it out sold all the other Jaguars combined with one model. And I think you're going to have the same kind of dynamic with this car. I, I, I hope so. And, and I think when you look at today's SUVs, they're really no compromise vehicles from a fuel economy perspective, from a driving dynamics perspective. And then of course, as I previously mentioned, you get all of that functionality and sense of security with an SUV that in many cases you don't get with a passenger car. And I think consumers have discovered that and hence they're gravitating towards SUVs. Reed, interestingly too, you're combining dealerships with Maseratis and uh, go through that a little bit of how you plan to roll this out. You know, where can people go and buy this vehicle? Right. Well, currently right now we have 170 dealers in the U.S. that are offering Alfa Romeo. Uh, some of them are dueled with our Fiat brand to give that true Italian experience, but most of the growth, and about 60 of them uh, right now, are dueled with Maserati. 
uh, Alpha and Maserati are headquartered uh, together in Modena, Italy. Uh, both vehicles are 100% built uh, in, in Italy and it's a great Italian combination and the two product portfolios fit together quite nicely. Midsize SUV, midsize car in Alpha, full-size cars, full-size SUVs in Maserati and then a couple of boutique players with respect to both brands. So it's a great combination and in China 100% of our distribution network will be Alpha Maserati uh, dualed. Looking at it around the world, you, you've got three major uh, regions uh, that you'll be looking at for sales, Europe, North America, China. How do you, you expect them to shake out as, as far as volume? Well, right now, uh, EMEA, the European uh, region, will, will lead, the, uh, lead the charge. We've got over 900 dealers in the European region. There's been steady continuity with Alfa Romeo there for since 1910 when the brand was uh, introduced. Uh, Alfa Romeo will be brand new in China and we're now returning this brand fundamentally after a 20-year absence to the U.S. So from a volume perspective, uh, uh, EMEA will probably uh, lead the charge with about 40%, and then the other uh, uh, 60%, 30% each in about uh, the Asia-Pacific region and the North American region, give or take. And, so, and just for those who don't know, EMEA is the European market, essentially. Yeah, yeah. European, Middle East, and, uh, and Africa. Yeah. So, so can, I, can I talk about the car, actually? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and bring it back. So I just spent like two hours driving it. And what really impressed me about the car was that a lot of, it's nine inches taller uh, than a Julia. And so it's a tall car. It's an SUV. And um, there are a lot of SUVs that do things that, that they shouldn't do, right? They, they're, they handle well. Uh, they feel like they're sports cars. But most of them, and I'm talking about the German competition, do it because there's a lot of electronics that are there keeping the car going the way that you want it going. And so th there's a sense that the car does everything. It does it well. But it's not you that is doing it, but it's the car that's doing it. And what impressed me about um, this car was that I felt like I was actually directly hardwired to it. So while it's tall and while it's kind of a, a crossover, it still feels like you're connected to the road and like you have input and it's not all the electronics that are actually making the car, you know, be a Superman versus your driving ability. And that's absolutely one of the things that we set out to do with Alfa Romeo is really put the, the driver at the center of the experience and increase that connectedness between the driver and the car where the car isn't driving you, you're driving the car. And putting that driver at the center, I think, is one of the key differentiators of Alfa Romeo, not only in the Stelvio, but also with that of, uh, of the Giulia. And I think you can, you can feel that, as you sensed, uh, uh, Roman, when you, drive, uh, when you drive the car. Uh, when you look at the performance of the vehicle, the Stelvio, 280 horsepower, best in class, 0 to 60, best in class horsepower, and that, too, is a key calling card of Alfa Romeo. And at the beginning of next year, we'll bring out the Quadrifoglio, the four-leaf clover version, where we'll put in the Ferrari derived 505 horsepower engine. And we're very confident, like that of the Giulia, that the Stelvio will be the fastest uh, SUV in the world when we put it to the test. So that's coming when? Uh, the Quadrifoglio? Look for that about Q1 of 18 uh, yeah. to arrive in uh, North American dealerships. Right now it's the 280 horsepower version, 0 to 60 in 5.4 seconds which is also uh, best in class with respect to that motor. Yeah, we, we timed it, you know, just out ourselves uh, on the road here by hand, and yeah. the numbers were awfully close, so I, I'm yeah. believing your number In there. your old school yeah, methodology exactly. there, yeah. It wasn't yeah. exactly timing lights, but yeah, yeah I, I would uh, uh, echo what Roman was talking about. It, it's a light-feeling vehicle. For sure, you know, when you look at the, the amount of aluminum, magnesium, carbon fiber, that we have put into all Alfa Romeos, including the Stelvio carbon fiber drive shaft and a perfect 50-50 weight uh, distribution. And as I keep mentioning, it's the driving dynamics of the Alfa Romeos that are really setting them apart from the competition. There's a lot of great options that are out there for consumers to, uh, to choose from, but if you really want to get that true authentic driving experience, um, Alfa Romeo is, is really uh, the way to go. The other sense I got for this car, I was trying to figure out what my review is going to be, right? And I'm thinking, how do, what, what angle do I take to make this unique and interesting? And I thought to myself, you know, this is the least off-road worthy crossover, and that's a good thing. Because, you know, you've got this big front air splitter, you've got these massive brakes, right? It's, you've got 100% of torque that can go to the back wheels. It's, it's, yep. it's, it's, it's focused at being a performance vehicle. And the more off-road worthy you make it, the less you make it as a sports car. And I thought, you know, that's probably true. And I, I'm thinking, I'm gonna speak for you guys, right? But I'm thinking to myself, if I'm FCA and I want somebody to buy, let's say an off-road worthy vehicle, I'm gonna send them to the Jeep brand. 
Right. This is. <laughs> we like to keep them in the Alpha showroom, but uh, absolutely, but, it is a performance that, yeah. SUV yeah. first for sure. But it'll get the job done uh, with its uh, standard all-wheel drive. Yeah, I'm sure it's good on dirt roads and yeah. snow. Absolutely, it'll get you through the winter. Yeah. Strong rear-wheel drive bias in day-to-day -day driving to help improve efficiency from a fuel economy perspective. But then, when it's needed, it'll immediately engage uh, all four-wheel drive to give you that greater sense of security and help you with traction in inclement weather. Well, the first thing that jumped out at me when I drove the Julia last fall is that the steering is like nothing else I've, I've ever driven. It is so fast and so precise, but it's not touchy at all. It, it, it's, it's like a, a, a precision instrument. And somehow you managed to get that exact same feeling in a vehicle that's nine inches taller and 400 pounds heavier. I mean, you know, where is the engineering done on Alfa Romeo, and how much more can we hope for from this Julia platform that seems very strong? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, all of the engineering of this, two senior managers from Ferrari developed this, uh, this Giorgio architecture that houses both the Stelvio as well as the Julia, headquartered in the, the Motor Valley in uh, Modena, Italy, where our Maserati headquarters are, 20 miles up the road from, uh, from Ferrari. So it's largely in the, the DNA already, but it's that 50-50 weight distribution not only the steering feel, but even the steering angle of the steering wheel. It's, it's putting that driver at the center where I'm glad you've, uh, you've sensed it because it's, it's absolutely a differentiator as well as to how connected the driver is with the car. Well, good. With that, I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap up this segment, but I want to thank all you guys. Roman Micah, Mark Phelan, Reed Biglin. Don't go away, folks. We're going to take a short break right now, give a shout out to our friends at Bridgestone, but we're coming back to talk a lot more about the Alfa Romeo Stelvio. And we're back talking all about the Alfa Romeo Stelvio, and we still have Roman Micah and Mark Phelan with us. But now we're adding Peter Hogerveen to the list because he's the guy in charge of all Alfa Romeo in North America. Peter, great to have you back on Autoline After Hours. Thanks, John. Yeah, we uh, last time we were sitting in a studio with a beautiful black portfolio in front of us. So that was, uh, was fun talking and fun looking at stuff. So I appreciate you having me back. Yeah, now you've got another bullet in the gun, so to speak, with an SUV. This has got to be tremendous for you to be able to introduce this vehicle in the North American market. Oh, for sure. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've, uh, you've heard about it, you read about it. This is one of the fastest growing segments in the industry. So timing-wise, perfect for us to offer a mid-size utility vehicle. And obviously we're making sure we're protected. We stick with our alpha DNA, you know, to make sure we, uh, we deliver on the driving dynamics that people are looking for. And I'm sure the experience is here today. I'm, I'm, you know, you'll probably confirm that uh, that's what we're doing here. So uh, very excited to launch a vehicle this time, mm -hmm. for sure. And the primary competitors are some very well-known vehicles from very well-known brands, the Audi Q5, BMW X3, Porsche Macan, you know, that sort of stuff. Uh, how do you establish, your, establish yourself with a new, a new vehicle in a brand very few people have much familiarity with? So I think that's a, that's a good point. Hey, we've kind of done it already earlier this year when we uh, launched the Julia, we kind of went after the, the same competitive set. What's important for us is that we continue to build the awareness for the brand. Obviously, Julia and especially Quattrofolio has been very successful for us, you know, you, you know, with our record race times that we set in the Nuremberg Ring, but also the feedback we've received in regards to driving dynamics and from you know, journalists alike as well. You know, people enjoy driving the vehicle. We expect the same thing. So we're going to bring the vehicle in the market quite organically. And then come August, we're going to increase our, uh, our media and then, you know, incl include some broadcasts to really start building that awareness for the uh, Stelvio and, of course, the Alfa Romeo brand. And, and I would have assumed that the Julia sort of spoke to the built-in base of people who already liked Alfa Romeos. It's a sports sedan. It's the kind of car Alfa Romeo was always successful with. And that this would be the vehicle that would broaden you to a, a, a bigger audience. Is that true or are, are you still uh, uh, getting uh, in touch with the Alfisti? I, I think you hit it right on. Um, of course, yeah, the Alfisti have been asking for this vehicle as soon as we announced it was coming, you know, back in LA. Um, but <clears throat> yes, this is this is a different buyer, correct? You know, even from a demographic uh, perspective as well, it's a, it's a more of a 50 50 uh, gender split as well. So, hey, we need to talk to a different audience. So, we'll be doing a lot more <clears throat> creative executions to be able to, you know, to, to reach the non um, uh, car enthusiasts or the, the non Alfisti as well. But um, what we see from Julia already, we see a lot of people coming in that you don't consider to be an Alfisti as well. A lot of people coming out of A4s and you know uh, three series and C classes alike. So I think what we're doing so far is we're really good. And obviously, 
hey, I, uh, I would be kidding myself, but the Super Bowl obviously helped significantly as well, building that awareness. So. So, so we did a live video already, and the number one comment was reliability. So I guess I have to ask you, what have you done to address reliability, and how are you making sure that that doesn't become an issue for the brand? So to be completely honest with you, um, you know, we know we're competing in a premium segment. We know these other OEMs have built quite a reputation in regards to reliability. So first of all, I mean, it goes down to the develop back to the development of the vehicle. You know, that's why we have an all-new architecture completely designed and developed for Alfa Romeo that goes against these competitive set. You know, obviously, hey, we offer best-in-class performance that people expect from an Alfa Romeo, but from reliability as well, you know, we've done obviously extensive testing on the vehicle. Um, we have an, a warranty that is on par with the competition as well. So we're making sure, you know, that's the, that's the number one step is get into the market with a, with a, with a competitive warranty. That's our, our faith, our trust as well. I know we've only been in market six months, so for me to do any predictions on how it's going, so far the feedback has been really good and, you know, uh, there, there's no, nothing for us to be really concerned about at this point. So part of the way of ensuring reliability or that it gets dealt with quickly is working with the dealers. How are you specifically working with them to make sure that this gets addressed? So, I mean, I have a, this is a, this is a true example I'm giving you right now. Every negative survey we receive gets emailed to myself. Mm -hmm. So I reach out myself to the dealer and make sure, hey, let's, let's get on this right away. You know, nine out of 10 things can be you know, resolved easily, quickly. So that's one of the things. And obviously, you know, we, we stay in touch with our dealer network, you know, through our, uh, through our warranty system as well. So. We make sure we realize you launch a brand one time, you know, then we make sure that we stay on top of that and then, uh, you know, contain if there's any issues. You, you mentioned the uh, Stelvio because it's an SUV, uh, more uh, equal uh, split uh, between men and women. One, one of the things that struck me in those wonderful uh, commercials you had in, in, in the Super Bowl is that the voice of the Julia is a woman. In one of the vehicles, you see a woman's foot in high heels getting out of the car. And then I saw she's getting out of the back seat. What is this? Why isn't she driving the car? Well, what is your expectation for you know, women owners and drivers with the Stelvio and, and is there, are you going to reach out to them specifically? Oh, for sure. Good point. So yeah, we are obviously when we target, uh, we know we have to uh, target a vehicle like that. I think you see a lot of uh, 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 women integrations in our commercials and voice as well. It's also part of, part of, the, uh, part of the elegance, correct? So that fits the Alfa Romeo brand very well. Yes, we will uh, reach out to our, you know, our, our new demographic, as I may say. So, uh, you know, we have targeted campaigns for that as well, for, you know, to reach, to reach the buyer as well. And we know, uh, Julia too, we see actually, you know, um, uh, it's, it's a very popular vehicle among women as well. And I think the name kind of drives the curiosity, but I think also obviously styling and the refinement in the inside of the vehicle really draws a, a wide range of people, not limited to, you know, just your Alphiste, you know. So one of the things I really liked about the car was it has this drive select mode uh, and in the German competition you get like five different modes and one of those is individual which you can select like 10 different. Yeah. You guys got DNA, right, which is very simple, dynamic, is it neutral yep. and it should be DNA efficient, but somehow you snuck an A in there. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, with, a, with a brand with a history of 105 years old, you got to make sure you keep DNA in there. But it's, it's so simple. You just dial what you want, and it changes all these different parameters, and you can actually feel the difference between the dynamic mode and, let's say, the efficient mode. And one of the things I noticed right away was that in the dynamic mode, it lets you hold um, these massive sh paddle shifters and lets you hold the gear. Yep. So a lot of cars, they'll say they'll let you manually control an automatic gearbox, but they won't. Basically, once you hit the red line, it'll upshift yep. for you. In the D mode, you can just hold it and it just stays there. It's really fun to drive. Yeah, and I think that it's, that it's so important for us too. You know, it's, it's more than just a switch. You know, I, I, uh, speaking of the location too, it's quickly to use, it's easy to control, and then, you know, we know, and one of the benefits too is like it stays in the mode too when you park your car. There's nothing more frustrating than having your settings set and then have to go back and change it again. But the uh, actual the shift mode you talk about, as soon as you push the lever, the shifter to the left, in any mode, it will stay in gear if you want to use the pedals as well. And personally, I can't help myself using the pedals all the time because they're so easy to approach, to reach, and it also helps with downshifting and kind of gives that little driving dynamic, especially here in the roads in, uh, in Nashville, you know, so. You've done a lot of television advertising with the Julia. You know, we've yeah. been talk, touching on that a little bit, but what are your plans for getting the word out about the Stelvio? I mean, from a marketing standpoint, advertising standpoint, how are you going to cover the waterfront with this? So I think with Stelvio, we're still building the brand awareness. So there will be a strong broadcast campaign as well for Stelvio. We're, our plan is to launch in August. Um, you know, we should have ample vehicles on the ground for the dealers. So because there's nothing more frustrating for dealers to put an ad out and there's no vehicles available. So we make sure we got inventory. We'll do broadcast, but then we're also going to do a more grassroots approach. Uh, you will see a lot of sponsorships and event partnerships. We want to reach the client where the client goes naturally instead of you know creating a ride and drive on its own we're going to partner with a lot of 
you know, high-end media partners as well to make sure we get the right people in the vehicle. And, and when you've got them you know, in, in dealers, you know, will you be doing uh, events you know, around the, the country at your dealers to, to get potential owners into the vehicle? You know, what are you going to do that? So way? we actually uh, already done that. Um, so after we launched the vehicle in uh, New York, we had eight style vehicles which we sent across the country already prior to launch to start building that awareness. So our business centers, our nine business centers, an opportunity to get you know, dealerships engaged, some did regional events. But to your point, yes, we will work with all our dealers and we want to make sure we create that event because it's more than just an event. We're, we're, we're just, we're building awareness for the dealership as well at the same time. You know, I, I guarantee you many people can tell you where our local BMW is, but if you ask for an Alpha, it might be a little bit more difficult. So we want to make sure we drive traffic to them to build awareness for themselves as well, but also give the customer an opportunity to experience the Alfa Romeo at the, at the dealership because so, at the end of the day, sorry. So I know two of the three big numbers, zero to 60 is 5.4, Yeah, right? that's correct. Uh, MPG combined is 24, which is pretty amazing yeah. for a car that has 300 horsepower and does it in 5.4, but the speedometer says 160, but what is the top speed? 144. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's true, that's, so, that, so 144 uh, uh, miles per hour top speed. And to your point, I mean, really, we stick with what is, what is important for us is to continue to deliver on that alpha driving DNA dynamics because at the end of the day, that's why people look at us, so. Real good, we're gonna have to finish the segment right now, but Peter Hogeveen, thanks so much for stopping by. Really good having you here. And folks, don't go away, we're gonna take a short break, but we're gonna be coming back and talking a whole lot more about the Alfa Romeo Stelvio. We're back, we're at Leapers Fork, Tennessee. We're sitting out on the front porch of the Leapers Fork Distillery, and I hope we get a chance to chase some of their whiskey and bourbon later on today. Mm -hmm. But we're talking about the Alfa Romeo Stelvio, as you all know, and joining us for this segment right now are Henry Payne, the car critic for the Detroit News. Hey, John. Lauren Fix, the car coach, here live herself. Hi, John. And Paul Bryant with ABC. Buongiorno. Buongiorno, hey, uh, now we get some Italian flavor. Yeah. In. So I'm just going to throw it out. Henry, we'll start with you, and the other two can pick it up. We've been out driving this vehicle all morning long. What do you make of it? It's a good, it's a good crossover. I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a sedan guy, and, and I, like, I like a low CG. And uh, so my, my pick would be the Julia, but in terms of, uh, of a crossover that mimics a good sedan's handling, I, I'd say the uh, Stelvio is there. Yeah. Lauren, what do you think? I am impressed. I've been waiting for this vehicle. This is one of those vehicles you hear about and you go, well, believe it when it actually comes in dealer and we are there. And getting the opportunity to drive it is one, I wanted to be on the first wave, the first opportunity. I am not dissatisfied. I currently drive a Porsche Cayenne. So Ooh, this is like comparison. a Macan. So for me, I almost bought a Macan, but I'm a diesel fan. But I have to say, this is a great vehicle. And I don't, I, you know, we drive a lot because we go, it's great, but really, they're, they're transportation, but that's not transportation. That's a lot of fun. Paul? Well, I'm not going to be the flying ointment here. <laughs> uh, so much of the market is SUVs and CUVs right now. <clears throat> this is one of those special crossovers or SUV or CUV that makes me not want to take the shortest route between two places. From the second turn engaged it just felt so incredibly neutral and I kept saying give me more give me more give me more and I liked it and uh, we can go on for a while and I'm sure we will as to why but overall boy well part of it nice. is uh, it's a 50 50 weight distribution yeah. and that's highly unusual in a crossover vehicle usually it's front wheel based or front what am I trying to say? Nose heavy is what I'm trying to say, right? This is a 50-50 wheel balance. But Henry, you thought the same thing too, right? Pretty neutral vehicles. Well, it's also a rear wheel drive platform. That's very unusual in uh, SUVs. So, um, rear, got, rear drive platform, but this is an all wheel drive it's vehicle. It's an all wheel drive vehicle, but it's, but it's, it's got a longitudinal engine in it. It's, uh, it's, a, it's rear wheel drive biased, and, and with the all wheel drive, you can throw uh, or the computer, not me, the computer can throw 100% of the torque to, to the back wheels. So it, it has the dynamics, as I say, of, of a Julia, which is the same platform it's on. So I think that really changes the 
character of the car. I mean, most F SUVs these days, Mazdas, which are very good, uh, Audis, uh, they're, they're front wheel drive, transverse engine platforms. So th this car is, is built from the ground up to handle, and I think you notice that in addition to the 50-50 balance. The other thing I like was the steering on it. I find it very light, very precise. I don't know, what do you guys think? I, I agree with that. I think precision-wise, you can play with it in you know the advanced fuel economy mode, or you can put it in neutral or dynamic. We tried all. And I, of course, I prefer the dynamic. You know, the All day long. One. All day long, right. <laughs> Would I drive it in anything else? Probably not unless I was taking my mother-in-law home or something like that. Well, maybe I'd cruising the on the freeway. You know? yeah, but, yeah, but that's about it. But as far as precision and steering when you where you place it it goes and we didn't both notice how neutral it was yeah maybe paul drove it first and he immediately put it into the manual shift mode but i personally liked it in the regular drive mode where i could use the paddle shifts which are big and i have very small hands so for me to grab all the all the controls it was all right there it was very tight and compact everything was easy to use it was very a driver experienced car i didn't find it more of like a it's a luxury car that's you know, kind of sort of wants to be. It really was designed around the driver. And the, the, the I haven't been in the sport yet, but do, do the paddles follow the steering wheel? They're, they're on the they're yeah. column mounted. Yeah, they're column mounted. Oh, they're column mounted, so they're not yeah. steering wheel mounted. So mm -hmm. you still got to reach for them a little bit. Yeah, but you know what? They're in the right place and they're big enough. Yeah. That you can go ahead and select them. There, there are a lot of cars where I think to myself, why did they go through the exercise of putting these here? You're never going to use them. I drove it for, I don't know, 15 miles in just regular let it figure out what it wants to do mode. And then we got into some twisty stuff and I said, okay, let's play. Slap it over on the left side, play with the paddles. It made me not want to come out of that. Uh, and, and when you select a gear, it's staying in that gear. It's not coming out, which, which is really nice. It's not like it's saying, you need to be at the next one. You know, no, it's, it's saying, okay, you want third, you got third. Well, what we found, too, is because Henry and I drove together, and we have not yet been in one with paddle shifters. We'll get into that probably after the show. But if you put it in the dynamic mode and you start really driving it hard, it goes, mm -hmm. aha, they really want to go. Yeah. And it'll hold it in gear longer. So yes. even if you don't have the paddles, it'll hold the gear that you not, want. Not yeah. longer. Completely. Uh, well, maybe with the paddles. I don't think this was complete. Yeah. So you, yeah. you take no. it another yeah. step up with the paddles. Yeah. yeah. The computers are smart. But I, but I will say, just to, to finish on the steering, I, I, in my mind, the steering is the, is, is the definitive piece of the car. I mean, this, this is two turns lock to lock. Same steering that's on the Julia. And, and tight. Yeah. And you really, the, the steering wheels, it, it's small steering wheel. It's a mm -hmm. flat bottom steering wheel. And, and, oh, and, like and all of us have, have experience with high performance cars on track. And, and when, you're, when you're driving a track car, that's huge to have, to, to, to have as little steering input as possible. And you get this in an SUV, which really helps because it's still a 4,000 pound thing that, that moves around because, because it's high off the ground. So I think that steering really stands Lauren, out. Lauren often talks about turning radius a lot more than I do because you've got to juggle a lot more cars. Right, I'm always jacking but, around cars in, in the driveway and in the garage. But so. after you mentioned it, you know, yeah, you're right. It was a really tight turning radius yeah. too. So I mean, I, we tried it, it was yeah. really tight. I mean, if you were in a turn lane and the, you know, you get your little green light and you make a, a U-turn, you wouldn't be in the far lane, which most SUVs and crossovers, you're way over in the far lane, you'd right. probably be in the close lane. I yeah. was, it was as impressive as a Macan. And again, I think that's rear wheel drive. Yeah. Front wheel drivers tend to have a, a, a larger steering a radius. And yeah, yeah. That's another advantage of rear wheel. I wonder too, is this one of those E-Pass systems, you know, the electric power assisted steering or not? Is this, you know, does this have a metal bar running right down to the rack? <laughs> Nobody's really using that anymore. I mean, yeah. they've all become electronic everything. Right. If they could do electronic brakes, they would. So Thank God they haven't done that. But you that. know, is this one of those E-Pass electronic I ones? I don't know. I don't know either. Find out. So it is we're gonna my, my, it it, oh, it yes. is? Yeah. One of us yeah, yeah, yeah. now <laughs> takes four, four auto journalists yeah. to figure yeah. that out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, then that means even more kudos to Alpha. If they've got an E-Pass system with this direct feel of steering, light but direct, they know how to program steering. Yeah. Right, they well, did a good job. And it's huge for the brand too. I mean, you, you think of where this brand started. I mean, this is, this is a brand that has to stand by itself. It doesn't have, it's not like Acura, it has Honda buyers feeding it or Lexus that has Toyota. It's got to stand on its own like BMW, like Porsche. And so I, I think coming out with the Alpha 4C, uh, which, which, which did have uh, 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 standard uh, steering, direct steering in it, 
I, I, I think set a that, that set a that that, that, you're that set kind. a high. You're being kind. But that set a high bar. Like arms, Armstrong. Oh yeah, you got to be strong. Of course. Yeah. Right. But, but you but have a, you have alpha history. Yeah, I, I worked for Alpha for three years when we were racing Indy cars, uh, 89, 90, and 91. So you know, there's, there's, I've been around them for a long time. And my first brand new car ever was an Alpha two liter GT Veloce. I love this brand. And do you love this car? I do. What, how do you think it's going to do? It's got some tough competition to it. And for them to make, I, mean, I don't know how much time we've got here, but I think for them <laughs> to make the inroads that they need to make with this, they have to capitalize on everything that they've got, plus the one thing that they don't have. Which is? Which is a tie to their racing history. Totally agree, could not agree more. Yeah. I mean, this is how the brand was born, yeah. essentially. You know, it's it's absolutely part of it. And, you know, I'm gonna, let me put on my Oliver Stone hat here for, <laughs> for a moment. But when you take a look now at IndyCar, who is desperately looking to find another manufacturer, and within a week or so, they denied that they were able to put anything together. I don't believe that yet. I think that people are still talking, but here's the even more interesting one. Mr. Agnelli of the Agnelli family that own Fiat, major stockholders. Now, he had a rule that said, we're not gonna have family members racing against each other. So we couldn't have Ferrari and Alfa Romeo in Formula One competing against each other. He said, okay, Alfa, you're gonna go race IndyCars, Ferrari, you're gonna be in Formula One, Lancia, you're here. Everybody had their place in, in the order. Well, now that you've got, a, a, I don't want to say a divorce, but a separation of Ferrari as its own company, does that now open the window? Does that now open the window? for someone who might be looking for an engine program, who I won't mention any names, but it rhymes with McLaren, <laughs> uh, could, could be looking for- and they're in need. Yeah, they're, they're very much in need. So, and now you've got a, a, an ownership company in Liberty that's also looking to capitalize on their $8 billion investment they got in Formula One. Oh gosh, we could go on, couldn't we? Okay, and we will, but okay. first we're going to take a quick commercial break. We're gonna come back and talk a whole lot more about Alpha and Stelvio, but we gotta give a shout out to our friends at Lear. Lear Connexus offers a parental controls application with geofencing that sends notifications regarding driving behavior and location, including curfew alerts, acceleration alerts, and speed alerts all delivered to a smartphone application that includes vehicle location, driver notifications, and a report card of driving history, including notifications when predefined geographic boundaries are crossed. For more information, visit Lear.com. We're back sitting on the front porch of Leaper's Fork, the distillery in Tennessee, <laughs> talking about Alfa Romeo and Stelvio. And as just before we went to break, Paul, we were talking about racing. And that's one of the first things I asked Reed Bigland about last night and uh, before dinner. You know, come on, I mean, Alfa and racing, the two go hand in hand. Yeah. What are you going to do? And he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Nothing right now. Let us get this, let it, let's get this thing launched. Let's get yeah. this whole brand back on its feet. So I th yeah, but you can't have post toasties without milk. <laughs> <laughs> you don't. You, you you just don't have it that way. And I asked him the same question this morning, and yeah. Lauren and I were there, and he got just nervous. Yeah. I mean, you know, and here's a, here's a guy, you know, I, I keep thinking everybody's first question to him is going to be, what do you bench press? But, <laughs> yeah. but I think. Yeah, because he is a bodybuilder. Yeah. Holy shnikes. Yeah. But, uh, but nevertheless, I, I asked him about this scenario and how it played out possibly in IndyCar and also in Formula One. And he, and he is, he was not comfortable. Yeah, and this is a guy who is because you want to steal part of his budget and go racing. No, no, well, no wait a minute. <laughs> I want to steal part minute. of his budget and go racing. <laughs> no, wait a minute. No, but, we do. But, <laughs> there is but, there is money to be made out there. That's Absolutely. true, but but yeah. I will say this. I mean, if if you look at their look at the brands, this is part of a larger, a much larger company. It's one of nine brands inside mm -hmm. the FCA uh, barn, 
and they've and they've got a racing brand, a pure racing brand. In the case of Ferrari, this is a brand that's trying to be a full line luxury brand. Ferrari's it's its own company. Yeah, Ferrari's no longer part of FCA. Yeah, they got their own stock and their own little shtick. Yeah. yeah, but you know, there's there's a lot of DNA between Same Ferrari. Boss. Very, yeah, it's very Italian. Italian. Yeah, <laughs> For, you know, they, and, and so I mean, there's only so much capital to go around. You got Maserati, right. also a performance right. brand. So I, I I I do have some sympathy here that they they need to get this thing on the ground and as a full line manufacturer. You mean sales. Sales meaning SUVs, and mm -hmm. and and uh, I, I think I think all their competitors are in the racing space. Uh, you know, Audi, Audi, Porsche, Jaguar, BMW, they're all there in GTLM Martin, or GTD. Right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think they do. They come into GTD or something at at some point uh, with, with the Julia. But I think right now they got to get product and they, they, they got to make sales. money. They, they got to make no, money before totally you go right. racing. Look, I believe they got to drive awareness too. Well, they do. They do, but. You know, first do it without spending a fortune on racing because that look, they don't have. If this vehicle doesn't yeah. really hit the bullseye, I, I think it's toast for Alfa Romeo. I don't yeah. think there's any coming back if this but thing they, doesn't sell big time. That's true with Julia as well. And no, but Julia is in pass car segment, and that's right. a shrinking segment globally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, right. here they've got their first true crossover ever in the and history they're in of the, very sweet spot. This is the, not only the, yeah, it's the hottest part of the global industry, and it's where you can really make money. That's right. If this thing don't work. Put a fork in it. I would it, suggest, though, that, that they, they have brought game to the game. Yeah, I agree. I, I think agree. so, too. Yeah, they got a very competitive product. I think Macan and F-Pace are going to get hurt by this. Mm. You may not see as much with BMW, Mercedes, Audi, Why Lexus. so? Why do you think? I think, when, to my mind, a Lexus owner is not like us. We are car people. We are, like, thick in it. Would I own a Lexus? Maybe. One of those versus one of, what, a Stelvio? I'm buying a Stelvio. But when, I mean, I own a lot of German cars, and I don't know, the Macan is great, but it's so pricey. Yeah. It's so pricey. Even if you're going to bring, the, you know, the Quadrifoglio against the Turbo, the Turbo's substantially more, $50,000 more. I'm buying a well, stuff there. Well, we don't know that yet. Well, we know it's going to be about $30,000 well, more. I'd say it's 30 more, but this one we drove this morning was 54 in the window. Right. Even at 80, you can't get a regular Macan, a regular Macan S. Macan You're, starts at 50. Starts at 50. But when you start putting any goodies on it that are standard on this, yeah. that price ratchets yeah. up yeah. very quickly. Porsche is the there. masters of marking up. Oh, my God. <laughs> I know. I told you, buy them off the lot yeah. and someone that maybe has some miles on it. Would you like mustard with your bratwurst? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, the mustard, the yeah. bun is extra, yeah, too. The and extra. the sauerkraut and the pickle. And I'm but, but the, the and, and you know, to go back to the racing thing, that's why Porsches can pour money into racing these days because they're making so much money on SUVs. Right. And I, I think, uh, it's a big chunk of the market. Yeah, $17,000 <laughs> per vehicle, I believe, is, is the current figure, which is the highest in the industry. Yeah. I well, I will say this though. I mean, we, we love this car as motorheads. My my problem with this car is on the interior. Uh, you, you come into this car; it's different. It looks different. It's not like every other Audi and BMW on the block. Mm -hmm. You come inside, and it's undistinguished inside. Talk about your Porsche. You know you're in a Porsche whether Absolutely. you're on the outside or the inside. You get into this car, and it could be anything. Well, and the steering wheel's in front of you, and I love that start-stop button right, right there. But you get beyond really cool. the steering wheel, and and there is nothing defining about this interior. Audi's Audi's got the virtual cockpit display, which is extraordinary. Porsche's got a lot of character. I think that's a, that's a shortcoming with the Jaguar mm -hmm. too. But but there, I didn't Jaguar's I didn't find display. anything yeah. off-putting about. No it. no 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 no. But you know, what Henry is saying I, is I, that I, I it's all good. The the use of materials is good. The design is clean. It's simple to use. Color combinations. But, everything. But it, you, it, it doesn't scream Alfa Romeo. The steering wheel does, and I, like you just said, Lauren, the starter button right on the steering wheel. You got that big logo right in the center of the wheel. The, we, the but, seats are embossed with the logo. You know, a lot of companies will say, we're going to take exterior styling cues and continue that on the interior. And the grill of this vehicle is by far the strongest styling yeah. statement. And uh, uh, as it is with all Alphas, they should have some of that reflected in the interior so that anyone gets in the car and they just know instantly, yeah, this is an Alpha. Because you live in the car. You don't live outside That's the car. Right. Other, other, one other minor, minor complaint I had about the car is, and again, we didn't get into the sport level like you guys did. I thought the brake pedal was a little soft. A little soft. You I know, good modulation. I you know, I, I, you know, I, I felt what I was doing, but I, I thought it should be a firmer pedal. Compared but, to the Germans. Well, compared to any good sport vehicle. Okay. <laughs> my my only nibbling yeah. around the edges thing is that on the power seat, it it hinged on the back so that you could put more tilt from the back. 
but there was no way to raise it up to give you more support under underneath the and it was a man bottom of There the was side. a manual thigh support. Yeah, but that only lengthened it. It right. really didn't give it any lift. Yeah. You do need a little so. bit of lift. I noticed that in a seating and position. We need support, it support and lift. <laughs> I'll tell you, I'm just glad, I'm just glad I can sit in the back separate. seat. And separate, too. I, I can't no, sit in the back seat of the Julia. I'm just glad I can sit in the back seat. Well, of this Henry, thing. you got your own zip code. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, love, I love the five door hatches. I can actually sit in the in the back of them. But I, you know, the the the, the one other uh, drawback here, and again, it's in the interior, is in the infotainment system. I mean, at a time when you when when the mainstream vehicles like like Toyota and Mazda mm -hmm. uh, have infotainment systems as good or better with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto and all these things in the mm -hmm. infotainment system. Again, this does not feel luxury in the infotainment system. It does not yet have Apple have, CarPlay. It, I believe it it's does coming. have Apple CarPlay. No, that's coming. It's, it's coming. not yet. Uh, and, 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 and I think and, 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 it's not on the breakdown list. They, they did and, go and finish your thought and then I'll add to and, it. And there's a new standard in luxury these days, which is Tesla which is that Tesla can come in and update your infotainment system over the air anytime at once. This car cannot do that. If you want, if you want, if you need, if you want Android Auto, uh, you got to take it in and get a hardware there's change. There's a good reason to buy a car that makes no sense. Well, no. yeah. <laughs> well, that, that, I, I don't like the over-the-air updates, and I'll tell you why I personally don't like the over-the-air updates. How are you doing, buddy? How yeah, he doesn't like me either, and I don't like his cars. Um, I don't like over-the-air because a lot of manufacturers have problems with hacking. And they leave it, it, when they reset it in the factory, it comes in as one, two, three, four, five. And then the dealer gets it and they go, hey, Henry, don't forget to change that passcode. And you're like, I'm so excited to drive this car. And you never do it. And then that's why these cars are getting hacked. Cars are getting stolen. And it's going to get worse as there's car-to-car -car communication. It's going to get worse as autonomous cars come in. The last thing I want is you updating it over the ear. I'll take it to the dealer. Send me a disk. Send me a thumb drive. Send me a download. I'll do it myself. But I am not. I do not want it open to the world. Well, I, I hear what you're saying. Personally. But this car can be hacked as it is without Android. The car can be hacked. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. Would you invite me back when you want to do a show on indemnification <laughs> of automobile companies <laughs> and hacking? Yeah. We could do that. Good. I'm that's, glad we're in Tennessee. We could have a yeah. bottle of bourbon on that one yeah, just yeah. to start with. You that's know a lot good. about that information. You're well, good. Researching it. We're going to wrap this part up. I don't want to thank all three of, uh, uh, you. of you coming in. You know, Henry Payne, Detroit News, Lauren Fix, the car coach, Paul Ryan, ABC. Thank you, thank you very much. You guys know your cars. Great talking with you. Love those cars. Thank, Thank you, you. Thanks for, Thanks the for having us. Okay, we're going to take a, another short break right now, and we're going to come back and show you more of what this car actually looks like. I want to show you some of the styling highlights of the Alfa Romeo Stelvio. And of course, we got to start with the front end because that's what really distinguishes this vehicle from any other in its class. And you start with this, this shape on the grille. It's what in Italian they call the Scudetto. It's the shield or the crest, almost like a family crest kind of thing. But two other elements that go are these air intakes that flank either side of it, lower down. It's what they call the tree level. And you're going to start seeing that graphic of the shield with these two other air intakes on the other side of it show up on every Alfa Romeo from here going forward. And like I said, it's what really makes this Alfa so different. Also, every car has all different kinds of wheels that you can choose from, but check out this with these, these circles that really define the, the spokes of the wheel. Very different. I think from a styling standpoint, it, it's quite unique. Let's come around to the back of the vehicle, which I think if you can say it's disappointing, it's the only disappointing part of the vehicle. Not because it's styled badly, but this could almost be anything. You know, it could be an Infiniti, it could be a Mazda. It doesn't stand out as well as the front end does. But another thing I want to show you here is how much interior luggage space is in this car. Moreover, you've got these rails on each side where you can use these tie-down straps to help keep any luggage well in place. Now let's take a look at the back seat because this is a bit of a squeeze here. And one of the problems is as I try to squeeze in is that whenever you turn the car off, the driver's seat goes all the way back. So before anyone gets in here who's taller than I am, you're going to want to ask the driver to really move the seat forward. Inside, this is a very clean design. Long horizontal lines. Very simple in its layout and everything oriented towards the driver as an Alfa Romeo should be. But again, a little bit of a complaint. Nothing wrong with it, but it doesn't scream Alfa Romeo. Again, 
This could be the interior of any other kind of car. And when they do such a great job with the front end, I wish they'd carry that on a little bit with the rest of the car. Anyway, that gives you a short overview of what the Alfa Romeo Stelvio looks like. And with that, we're going to wrap up today's show. I want to thank you all for watching us here on AutoLine After Hours, and be sure to join us again next week. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion, and by Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. Visit our website, autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday afternoons. Get your daily fix with Autoline Daily and in depth analysis and interviews with Autoline This Week. There's all that and much more at autoline.tv.